Hello and welcome to Bloke on the Range and we're here in Finland with Ian of Forgotten Weapons courtesy of Varastoleka and Sako uh, doing the Covid compliant Plan B Finnish Brutality 2021 themed the Winter War because it is winter, it is a balmy about zero plus one degrees. Mm -hmm. Actually nice and warm today. Yeah. Yesterday when we were shooting stages it was substantially colder. Yeah, and there'll be footage out on In Range, Forgotten Weapons and Bloke on the Range on that, so uh, no idea what order we're going to put it out in, but it will be there at some point. So um, yes, what, what way to make it more brutaler than <laughs> to use World War II, early World War II era gear? Right. Yeah. Um, that, that'll be fun, right? But obviously, Ian is dressed as a Finn here, which is fairly obvious, but why are we dressed as Anglo-French yes. Why would be? Well, why would we be up here? Now, yeah. what's often forgotten about the Winter War um, is that the Soviet Union was de facto allied with Nazi Germany via the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. And uh, due to everyone switching around later in the war, this is conveniently forgotten. <laughs> um, but... The Soviet Union had invaded Poland a few weeks after the Germans had, and then just after that invaded Finland. And because the Soviet Union had invaded Poland, which was the reason why Britain and France went to war, um, it made the Soviet Union our de facto enemy, even though there was no uh, official war declared. Um, war were not declared. <laughs> war were not officially declared, but um, there was a plan for an Anglo-French expeditionary force to come to Finland to help out the Finns against the Soviet Union. Um, it didn't come to fruition in the end because they needed to be able to cross neutral Norwegian territory, which needed Norwegian permission, which would be them <laughs> violating their own neutrality. And they didn't want to do that because they were afraid of the Germans, who did it anyway a year later, but they weren't to know that. And the purpose of this video is just to go through the kit we've been using yesterday. And uh, I think we'll first describe the kit and what the inspiration is, and then describe how it went on the stages. So let us start with the one that people will not recognize not, so much. No. So this is the uh, new generation of French infantry gear. This was specifically designed in 1939 for a new type of Alpine troops. There were already Chasseurs Alpins, which is a, a mounted troops, but they wanted an even more specialized, which was the high Alpine troops. And this was the opportunity to finally get away from the greatcoat is good for all system and um, so the base the trousers are the same as the infantry 1935 sort of golf wide golf uh, the, the, pattern. they're breeches they actually lace yeah, up down the side inside. The sides um, you still have uh, a shirt and a tie I'm wearing a tie under here um, down there. someone has to be classy <laughs> yeah, he, he shot me. the entirety of Finnish brutality wearing a tie first person ever to do that <laughs> yeah um, and then you have layering you but you got issued a, um, a sleeveless knitted sweater you have a knitted sweater um, and then comes this really very very nice smock it's it's very thin material but extremely densely woven hence um, if you're rolling around in the snow it's fine I haven't tested it in the wet I suspect it will soak through anyway I'm sure we'll see today <laughs> because it's it's above freezing yeah. just so it, it's wet snow however what they would also have had was a rubberized uh, white smock. I have conflicting reports. Some say that they're reversible with the sort of earthy colour and white. Um, and then if it got really cold, they have half a dead sheep uh, turned inside out, just a, a white tanned or bleached uh, woolen coat on top. Uh, the boots are uh, studded mountain boots. There were slightly different patterns uh, because there were the standard mountain infantry and there were uh, the ski scouts who had slightly lighter equipment and more flexible um, for maneuverability but um, with this gear they were hiking Hotchkiss up top of mountains in uh, in Norway later in the campaign uh, without any substantial issues helmet is the standard M26 Adria uh, there is a big disc uh, Tacht Beret for uh, when you don't have to wear your helmet <laughs> And actually yeah. a white cover for the helmet. Yep, there's a white cover. There is also a white cover for the beret as well. Of course <laughs> there is. Which I don't really know why. I mean, for, I've seen it for parade now, they use it. Um, and he has a fantastic contraption under yes, the Yes, yes, you should show Can people you? what that is. Yeah, because it's so cool. Because you're wearing a steel helmet uh, in extremely cold temperatures, and you have this, 
they're all head suspenders, I suppose. <laughs> 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 but you, I mean, you've got a leather liner, so it keeps your skin away from the metal. Uh, but this keeps your ears warm. And there is also a padded section here on the front and at the back, so that it doesn't get too miserable because you get a, you get a substantial bit of pressure if uh, if it's a bit snug uh, because you probably also maybe wear a, a balaclava and things on top so they were kept warm yesterday um, I was nice and toasty never felt the need to put any more layers on it's only minus six but um, the reports that I've read from the battles in Norway the main problem was the with the feet there was I think one unit had 60% frostbite Ooh. right on the feet Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. Um, bad kit, bad personal admin or combination? Um, from what I hear, there's most of the fighting, um, it was a peak by peak progression towards Narvik and they were just basically left, they were supplied with guns and ammo and, f and food when they could get it. They went oh. down to trying to boil their wine because <laughs> it was frozen and they were trying to <laughs> heat it up and yeah. Um, but in terms of kit, um, you cannot take this off in a hurry. No, there's a lot of buckles and straps <laughs> yeah. and laces. Oh, this, is a, this is a particular gator system. Uh, the infantry, the metropolitan infantry, was still had the wraps. Um, so this is a, uh, a leather thong that you zigzag up, and you've got two buckles, one under the shoe, and you cannot take this off in a hurry. And the shoe is still underneath are a leather sole. So in the end, it will seep in. And you have you have multiple pairs of socks in your pack, but if you're if you're out there two weeks with no way to dry it out, it's uh, mm. it's inevitable. Um, and you get a hood, which is a luxury. Yeah, you get a hood, which is nice, fits over the helmet. Uh, in terms of the actual webbing, uh, there nothing improved, shall we say? <laughs> it's the standard uh, late World War One webbing with. Uh, so the Y strap and a, a triangle at the back. Um, it has the M35 improvements so that you can hang your water bottle and a small pack underneath instead of having crisscrossed slings everywhere. The pouches are M35 as well so you have one big compartment and a, a smaller one around the corner and uh, if I remember correctly I've got like 45 rounds in each so you've got 90 rounds on your person, which is homemade. Now these ones, these ones are homemade. But you've seen that hopefully before <laughs> in the channel. And um, they have a handy little catch here, so they don't disappear around your waist. Well, hmm. that's clever. skiing. Yeah. yeah. And in terms of rifle, this is a first pattern Mass 36, which some of the troops genuinely only fired once they got to Scandinavia. Uh, <laughs> so some, some of the first... In, Nor in Norway, 1940, yeah, not coming so to walk, that didn't I mean, happen. It didn't happen in the end, but uh, they, went, they went as far as Norway in the end, where they saw action against the Germans. And yeah, some reports I've seen, particularly the um, there was a free Polish division which was incorporated into the Alpine troops, and they literally first fired on the uh, Norwegian shoreline. Wow. Uh, and the rest were hastily trained in 1939 when these, I mean, you see pictures of them lining up on the quay and you can see how new yeah, the stocks are still shiny. <laughs> um, yeah, and there were no reports about any, uh, any problems with these in the snow, but we're going to see. Yes, we can, we can yes. cause problems later. Um, and because of brutality is a two-gun concept. Oh yes. Um, it is not historically accurate <laughs> in World War II in any military for normal peons to have a pistol as well yep. as a rifle, contrary to video game FUDLAW <laughs> yes. yep. and movie FUDLAW. So yeah, for, for, for that I am wearing a, a, a pistol which I wouldn't have, but I'm, I've got the oldest practical my you get millimeter pistol. pistols. <laughs> Wait a I, I, I have in my possession. Uh, I didn't want to go with the um, 35A or 35S because the ammunition was a pain for this one as it was, and I don't have enough magazines. And so yeah. I decided to go for 9mm. And so I still, however, remained French 
and I have a Mab PA15, one of the big old forgotten Wonder 9s, bow tanker, but um, I find it very gentle to shoot and it's got a large mag capacity which will compensate for my inability to hit anything. So, so all right, all over right. to you. Yeah. Now, um, my get up is inspired by a photo that someone posted on Facebook of um, Scots Guard ski troops at Chamonix during the winter of the Phony War. So it's either late 39, early 1940, and they're standing there and they're wearing basically standard infantry equipment. They're wearing great coats. Um, there's two things that struck me that is very, very interesting for the normal guys was that they were wearing cartridge carriers instead of basic pouches for brand gun magazines. There's a sergeant in there who has um, a set of cartridge carriers on one side, binoculars and compass pouch on the other, and I thought that was an interesting get-up, and I, I haven't had a chance to do more research about it. Um, and there's another photo that you sent me from the Narvik campaign showing ski troops, and they're wearing the same infantry get-up. Now, the 37 pattern gear, we covered this a bit um, in the past, the suit, uh, was designed around ski suits of the era, so it makes sense that the ski troops would just have that, and it's it's baggy and very lots of freedom of movement and a short little short little coat to minimise the amount of um, material used and gives there, good right? gives good freedom of uh, freedom of movement. Um, now, as a um, uh, a little departure for brutality, because closing these pouches on the clock is just going to be a nightmare and we found in the past that they dump ammo if they're left flapping around. Um, I've doubled up so I've, I've got some I've taken the hangers off so I've got uh, 5, 10, 15, 20 rounds each side. Um, for the pistol I've um, got a standard, this is an original 37 pattern revolver holster intended for an Enfield number 2 um, which has a FN BDA-9 in it, which was adopted by Finland as the pistol model 80, I believe. Um, they did not use that in the Winter War. Which they did not use in the Winter War. <laughs> I have not found a Browning High Power, and I was not going to bring my Enfield number 2, and exotic ammunition, and no. Um, I've got a bit of paracord so I can tie it down so it doesn't flap around. And uh, the, they were never intended to be mounted this way, but you see it particularly late in the war. I suspect it was alley and cool for officers to... <laughs> to wear them down like that. Um, it attaches to the bottom of the ammo pouch, but the idea is that the pistol, it's not even a holster, it's a pistol pouch. Yeah. Goes there with the ammo pouch on top of it. And it's it's actually a fairly clever integrated system. Um, I have a bayonet and due to federal police deciding the number four spike is a uh, is a dagger. I've got a post-war number nine bone blade. It looks far more like a dagger. Mm -hmm. And rifle wise, in this photo, the, the thing that really struck me uh, was that they are carrying, they're either Trials number 1 Mark 6s or Trials number 4 Mark 1s. You can't, you can't tell, you can only see the muzzle, so you wouldn't, and it's not a great quality photo, so you wouldn't see the details around here that would positively identify it. Um, and you may notice the magazine's a bit square, because this is a, an all bells and whistles sterling conversion in 308, and because the match is sponsored by Sako, who provide 556 and 308 ammunition it helped in the ammunition logistics and uh, I'm running it in Swedish Mauser clips uh, because NATO charges are just disastrous it is set up for NATO ones but they're parkerized they're horrible it, uh, even with I mean I've been running bare fingers with tramp fingerless tramp gloves um, to get some feeling but then you get to the end of the stage and realize you have no feeling anymore and your fingertips hurt mm. which is fun so, anyway, I've, we've blathered enough. We've got all this stuff. What don't you have? I don't have any of that crap. So, the Finns um, were perpetually short of funding. Hold that for a moment. So, what they did have, well, let's see. Let me unbutton this a little bit and I can show you what is actual Finnish equipment. And that is basically just a wool, it's a German style tunic and We'll do the whole stripping thing here. Da, 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 da. Better not sing and, it too well or we'll get a copyright strike. Yep. And wool pants. 
Um, instead of all this nonsense with gaiters and straps and buckles and socks and then sock guards and all that <laughs> crap, they have nice, tall, solid jack boots. And I think these are fantastic. Um, these have been great while we're here. Um, they're easy to put on, they're easy to take off. They're high enough that snow doesn't get in them. Um, and with a couple pairs of wool socks, they're nice and warm. So um, over, basically as a Finnish army conscript recruit, um, you would be issued out that uniform and then under it, you would wear whatever you decided to bring from home in oh, terms of wow. undergarments. But you lived in Finland, so you had that. There was no need for the army to supply it for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've actually been wearing Varstalika wool under this, which I think is actually reasonably historically accurate yeah. because Finnish folks who live in this environment would have their own wool long underwear and under layers that they, like, that's what they wear. So that's what they would continue to wear. Um, over the top of that, I have, this is actually, this is like my one piece of not proper mm. equipment. The uniform here, by the way, is actually original Finnish army winter war surplus, uh, surplus not in the winter war, but afterwards. Um, it is an actual winter war uniform. Uh, this top is actually Dutch. It's a Dutch snow suit. Uh, but what the Finns did was <laughs> take bed sheets and uh, window curtains mm -hmm. and just stitch them up into snow suits like this one. I'm having a hard time buttoning now. Uh, and that is, you, you see some iconic photos of these things uh, in use. And this has also been extremely useful. Um, it's very thin, so it doesn't really provide insulation, but it obviously provides camouflage that works pretty well. That's why you can only see my head now. <laughs> um, and it's prevented all of my underlayers from getting wet, um, nice. especially the boots. Uh, you know, I can crawl through the snow and I still don't get snow down the boots because they're covered by the, you know, external layer snowsuit. So that's the uniform. Oh, and a hat. Um, the Finns did have helmets. Uh, they basically had uh, German and Austrian World War I helmets that they had acquired and just reused. Mm -hmm. um, I have one of them. Photos from the Winter War, it's pretty rare to see guys wearing them occasionally, but most of the time it was just a cap. If it gets really cold, you can unbutton the front of the cap and the whole thing folds down and under your chin. Yeah. Um, I think most of the soldiers were were too hardcore to, to <laughs> ever be seen doing that. I suspect that is an admission of weakness to actually unbutton the hat. Surprise me. Um, they did have a great coat, typically, um, yeah. but I don't have one of those and it's not cold enough to warrant it. Yeah. Now, in terms of web gear, uh, you got a belt. It's, it's a belt. And then I am wearing a Russian two pouch clip holder um, because it's what I had. Um, this is an actual Finnish one. Uh, and this is an original one that I wouldn't have wanted to run through the match anyway for risk of damaging it. But they are very standard stripper clip holders. Um, the typical finish one was three pouch. You would get one of these, not two, not all your fancy <laughs> crap with pockets for all sorts of things and <laughs> harnesses and straps. No, you get a belt and you get three pouches that you can fill with stripper clips. Um, a lot of these are actually German that they again got from Germany after World War I, uh, and then Finland also manufactured some of its own. How much does that, how many does that hold? Um, I believe this is 45 rounds. Right. Um, it's three clips per pouch, mm. and it's three pockets. Mm. Um, for the match, I am running two clips in each of mine, so I only have 20 rounds on me, plus five that I start in the gun. I suspect, like I've shot some brutality matches, I suspect I'm not going through more than 25 rounds in a stage. Yeah. Mm. I, I, I feel they're just because, but yeah. those actually have um, box lids and do retain yes. to a reasonable degree if yep. they're not secured. These, it's all yep. over the place. Yep. Um, I guess really the only other thing to mention are gloves. Um, I did read some accounts, in fact specifically it was an account about Simon Haya, uh, wearing three layers of gloves. And the bottom layer was a very thin knitted glove um, that gives you some dexterity without your hands being totally naked. And then the second layer was a fingerless heavier mitten so that the bulk of your hand can stay warm, but you still have that dexterity. And if you're not actually doing something, big heavy mittens. Um, these are Russian trigger finger mittens, but I would not actually try to use the trigger finger. Mm. What you would do is if you're going to shoot, you whip these things off mm. so that you have some dexterity and control. 
Uh, the pistol that I have is a Russian Tokarev, which is, it's actually a wartime Russian Tokarev. Uh, would post-date the Winter War, but it could theoretically have been available for the Continuation War. The taking off its former owners. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, which was a significant source of supply for the Finnish Army. Yes. Um, and I am shooting an M39. This would also be inappropriate for the Winter War because they just, these weren't really available in any quantity um, before the end of the Winter War, but they were the standard rifle for the Continuation War. Um, this one is a 1944 dated rifle, and it's a bit unusual in that it has a straight stock. Um, the earlier patterns of Finnish Mosins had straight stocks, the f and the early production M44s did. Uh, standard production M44 has a semi-pistol grip to it. Mm. That actually makes it a little nicer to handle, but uh, it is. this is a fantastic winter rifle, uh, and I think I'll be very happy with it through the match. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I think the big takeaway from yours is that, you, that you, you got the wool shell layer and everything else you bought, brought from home. Pretty much. And so I'm I forgot to mention what was going on underneath. Uh, we're both wearing uh, Varstule Kasarma uh, Merino under thing, long under things. Um, I've got a wool granddad shirt, which is great, uh, K canvas. I've got a K canvas v neck, v neck sweater because v neck, because why not? Um, no tie. No, no, what not a heathen I'm, barbarian I'm, army is this. No um, class at all. Not at all. Only officers were classy enough for ties. <laughs> um, with this over the top and I, my extra two layers are a leather jerkin and a great coat. Uh, I wore the leather jerkin a little bit when the wind got up but not while I was running a stage. So in terms of grubbing around in the snow... No problem at all for me. Um, these work fantastically. Um, yeah, it only takes you 20 minutes to put them on. Yeah, well, but then they work great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, once you're rolling around in the snow, the snow doesn't stick to this. It sticks to the wool but doesn't go through. Um, and then you've got also this woolen layer on top of the gaiters, which also sort of captures anything that's going to go through. At the end of the day, these were rather stiff. Um, so it, did, it does penetrate eventually. Um, but you've got so many layers underneath that it's not affecting the, the coldness of anything. Um, pouches, pouches are, are what they are. Um, thinking about what you were saying about closing them, I think I have to remember now but I don't think I was closing my pouches between the reloads. I don't think you were. Um, which I mean they stay They're sharp. better than these. Than some yeah. Of these. I mean in an earlier in an earlier video with three or three in these, once they're open, they're yeah. just bleh yeah. everywhere. And these, I've these, seen that a lot. You've got to jump up and down a lot for them to, yeah. to open a big again. Stiff um, pouch. I think the, the trade off of course is as the pouches get more secure they get harder and slower to access. Yeah. Yeah. These things are glacial to get <laughs> yeah. clips out of. Yeah. yeah, I mean, these were issued typically to non-infantry armed with the rifle. So mortar crews, machine gun crews, artillery crews, and infantry, their main job was carrying Brenga mags, mm. and they loaded out of, typically out of a, a, a nasty flimsy cloth bandolier. Mm. And I think we tend to overestimate the amount of firing that was actually done with the rifles and if you got 10 up which was doctrine from 1942 onwards but was almost certainly being done systematically before that anyway you're unlikely to have to reload in a in a in a hurry because the Bren gun does all the work um, contrary to various fuddlor myths about it yeah. um, the only thing I can say about this one is that you need to undo both of these to access anything anything yeah um, this one is all right. It's got one, but it's further round, so it's mm. <laughs> it's annoying. And the thing I've always wondered about is when you have these two two sides, is that obviously you're mostly right-handed, which is fine when you're loading from here. But then, but I just uh, again we over. I think we overestimate. Yeah. Um, riflemen will be spending most of their time under cover. Yeah. So I'm sure people will have redistributed. Yeah. Ammunition I think once this if is done. Yeah. Yeah. yeah if, if you've got time, once this one's Golly, done... Golly, it's not a problem for me to figure out which side to put the... the yeah, you've got one. That's, that's, one that's fine. That's it. Um, helmet stayed on my head. Yep. Um, yeah. Um, and in my case, I mean, I'm a huge fan of wool. I actually wear these as my ski trousers when downhill skiing. Um, I love them so much. The, the snow sticks a bit, but doesn't go, th doesn't go through. Great freedom of movement for the kettlebell throw. <laughs> Not a not a problem. Um, perfectly warm until the wind got up in what I'm wearing now, and then the jerkin over the top once the wind got up a bit and we weren't moving around. Um, 
that cut the wind pretty well because it's like half a cow <laughs> and it's blanket lined um and yeah the gear i mean it does it does what it does and you, you re you're reaching around to the fantasy pouches around around the back that's a bit of a pain um but i mean otherwise the the gear of this era i think is underrated in general um and then this cut was copied by the germans and the americans so it was doing something and you're uber simplistic i don't have all these problems <laughs> or advantages i suppose at the same time yeah i kind of like it um it would i don't know how much different it would be in real conflict but mm. for a match i like light and simple yeah i've shot in rigs like that and they suck yep yeah yeah it's interesting for this one is that um in terms of uniform itself had the war in france not gone the way it would this would have been the next hmm. uh, they would have finally ditched the great coat um yeah, in the end four years and they ditched it the thing completely but um there's I've seen one uniform collector's uh review where they show the 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 prototype and it's heavily based off hmm. what they've done with this with a with a mass 40. interesting because <laughs> it's a yeah. it, it's a, it's an interesting period because we sort of jump from 1940 and most people are just wearing brown versions of world war one stuff yeah. to well there's a there's a free french british equipped era which mm. is relatively short and then there's a free french american equipped era yeah. and they're carrying mostly m1917s but you do do see other things as well and they're equipped they, they look they look like americans <laughs> yeah, they're equipped exactly. by the americans helmet as well yeah. um, but there's this whole interesting bit in the middle for so what could have yeah. yeah yeah so Anyway, if you survived this far, thank you for very much for uh, listening to our blather. Uh, on In Range and Forgotten Weapons and Bloke on the Range, there will be content either in the future or already posted, depending on when you're watching this and when we actually, what order we launch stuff in. So please check out all three channels for some cool content with old guns and some new guns. Yes. So, thank you very much, Ian. My pleasure. And uh, bye. Bye.